Madam President, we all know the phrase that justice delayed is justice denied. It's a concept that appears in the Magna Carta. The words can be found in Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail. And today, as I come to the floor, I'm appalled at how the Senate has treated the Latino community in the final days of the 117th Congress. I cannot help but think that justice is being both delayed and denied for millions of Americans. There's just simply no way around it. Every year with its last votes before leaving town, Congress reveals where its priorities lie. With so many key issues and precious little time to insert them into the omnibus, we negotiate to deliver wins for our constituents before the Senate adjourns. But it is only when the final bill text is revealed that communities learn just how hard we fought for them. And this year, on issue after issue, Latino communities have learned that some of their top priorities were forgotten or ignored. Especially after a Congress in which we mustered the political courage to pass once in a generation legislation like the American Rescue Plan and the Inflation Reduction Act. It is a slap in the face to Latinos across our country to exclude them from this latest must-pass legislation. It's an outrage. And I come to the floor today to set the record straight on how this chamber has often stood in the way of meaningful equality for the Latino community. Take, for example, an issue that I have been leading for almost three decades, the National Museum of the American Latino. Two years ago, this chamber passed bipartisan legislation to establish this museum along with the American Women's History Museum. As part of that historic bill, we gave the Smithsonian a deadline of next week to make final designations on where they would be built. It's a deadline they were on schedule to meet after announcing two optimal sites on the National Mall just a few months ago. But when the Smithsonian Board of Regents indicated that they would need a legislative fix to proceed before meeting the deadline, members of this body decided to stall the effort in its tracks. Let me be clear. The legislative fix requested by the Smithsonian would have added zero dollars to our federal spending. Zero. It would have circumvented none of the processes that we follow under regular order. Rather, it would simply permit the museums to be built where the Smithsonian considers to be the best location, on the National Mall. So Mr. President, I ask my colleagues, why? Why? Why are we letting opaque closed door negotiations get in the way of finally telling the story of millions of Latinas and Latinos in this country? Why are we telling them they don't deserve to be on the National Mall, where our most iconic monuments and museums are? Make no mistake, Madam President, we belong on the Mall. We belong alongside the Museum of the American Indian, the National Museum of African American History. And we belong in the place where millions of visitors come to learn about their history and their past. The importance of these museums and their locations cannot be overstated. This is about standing shoulder to shoulder with more than 60 million Latinos across this country. It's about standing shoulder to shoulder with the tens of thousands of Latinos who wore the uniform of the United States, like the Borinquineros, an all Puerto Rican regiment who fought in the Korean War and earned the Congressional Gold Medal, as well as the many in business and science and the arts that have added greatly to our national success. It's about telling them that no matter their politics, their background, or their station in life, that they deserve to be recognized as part of our American story. And I, for one, simply cannot understand how it is that Congress has jeopardized their museum's site selection just days before the deadline. Mr. President, another, Madam President, another glaring omission of my concern is a lack of equity 
in this year's omnibus bill for the people of Puerto Rico. Throughout my 30 years in Congress, I have fought to address the systemic injustices that Puerto Ricans face when they try to access federal programs. And it's unconscionable that I should have to say it, but residents of Puerto Rico, three and a half million of them, are United States citizens. They're American citizens, full stop. And as American citizens, they deserve equality of the same earned benefits as those on the mainland, particularly when it comes to Medicaid. I have repeatedly fought for more than the smaller term patches that we have typically funded these programs. Now, I'm glad we were able to include a temporary fix for the next five years in the spending package to be considered by the Senate soon, but make no mistake, it is the bare minimum of what we should do. As I've said before, short-term solutions do long-term damage to beneficiaries, especially since federal dollars are what allow the island to stabilize their health care system, a health care system that in addition to inadequate funding has had to endure earthquakes, hurricanes, and constant power outages. So if this body is going to acknowledge the reality that Puerto Ricans are American citizens, if they believe that Puerto Ricans should be able to retain their health care providers while receiving high quality care, then they will work with me to enact a permanent fix to Medicaid. It should not matter whether you live on the island or on the mainland. And I will not rest until we have secured a full commitment, a permanent commitment, for the American citizens of Puerto Rico. And I implore my colleagues to stand with me and, most importantly, to support the residents of Puerto Rico when we convene, reconvene in the next Congress. Next, but not least, is an issue that for so many Latinos in the nation invokes the legacies of our own families who migrated to the United States. The continuous mistreatment of migrants under the southern border under Title 42. Title 42 is a disastrous relic of the Trump administration and Stephen Miller's racist immigration policies. It is grounded in the callous ideology that somehow Latino refugees who come to the southern border don't deserve humanitarian protections under our laws. The same protections, by the way, that my family received, that some of my fellow colleagues' families received, that millions of immigrant families have received for generations. Title 42 rejects immigrants at the border under the guise of public health, which we all know was a shoddy excuse by the Trump administration to achieve their goal of shutting down our asylum system. Under the Biden administration, it is as callous today as when it was first enacted in March of 2020. Why? Because Title 42 is an affront to our nation's values. It goes against every word that's etched on the Statue of Liberty. And yet, as it works its way through the courts, I've been hearing my colleagues, including some on this side of the aisle, to defend it. But they're wrong for two reasons. Title 42 has made border security an issue that Latino communities care deeply about, far worse at our southern border. And two, it has denied access to our asylum system for refugees fleeing persecution and torture. What are the three biggest groups that you find today at the southern border? They're not Mexicans. They're not Central Americans. They're Cubans, Venezuelans, and Nicaraguans. Why? Because they are fleeing oppression in those countries. The only individuals that benefit from, title 40, from extending Title 42 are the smuggling networks that exploit migrants, predominantly black and brown migrants who we turn away before adjudicating uh, why they chose to migrate. But beyond failing the migrants themselves, Title 42 is a failure by the very metrics it seeks to affect. Supporters of Title 42 like to say that somehow we're being invaded at our southern border. It's the favorite talking point of right-wing media pundits who claim that the United States is facing an invasion of migrants who want to change our way of life. To back it up, they point to data released by Customs and Border Protection showing there's been an increase in the number of migrant encounters on the southwest land border. 
but what their dog whistles and scare tactics ignore is the reason for this increase. Simply put, Title 42 has become the revolving door that allows migrants to try and try and try again if they are apprehended by immigration authorities. Because it circumvents our legal asylum process where we should be adding resources and manpower to come to a final determination. Yes, you qualify under our law. You're welcome. No, you don't qualify under our law. You're deported. And end the revolving door. But all Title 42 is push people back over the border and they go and try again. So when you see those numbers, it could be the same person trying 10 times. A process that would determine if someone is eligible for asylum or not, and if not, seek permanent deportation instead of having them return to the revolving door. Considering an amendment to prolong the damage of Title 42 is the last thing this body should be doing in order to advance the omnibus spending bill. Considering an extension of Title 42, when we have millions of dreamers, young people, who know only the Pledge of Allegiance and the flag of the United States as their flag, who know only the national anthem of the United States as their national anthem, and who still cannot become U.S. citizens, and the millions of people waiting to legally be reunified with their families in the U.S. who are U.S. citizens is the greatest failure of all. And finally, we come to the issue of Latino representation in our leadership offices and on the Senate floor. And the lack thereof shows the incredible disregard for our community. These are just a few examples of how the Senate has failed the Latino community in this last bill of the year. Relegating the Latino Museum as something less than worthy of being on the National Mall. Failing to deliver equal and permanent parity for the three and a half million United States citizens who call Puerto Rico their home seeking to prolong Title 42's harmful impact on our country, failing to have us represented in our leadership operations. And I recognize the fact that some of my colleagues may disagree with some of the points I've made, but you cannot ignore them. For 30 years in Congress, I've been speaking up for the equal opportunity, equal justice, and equal dignity that Latinos deserve. I have no plans of stopping anytime soon. For as long as I'm here, I'll be speaking truth to power for a community that too often has been told to wait your turn, wait your turn, to be thankful for whatever you're given, and to not rock the boat. Basta, basta ya. This is not Feliz Navidad, it's more like Bah Humbug. Latinos are a community of more than 60 million Americans strong. We contribute more than two trillion dollars to the gross domestic product of this country. We have worn the uniform of the United States in incredible numbers, disproportionate to our size of the American population, and we have shed blood and gave our lives for the country. And we will not be cast aside and ignored by the powers that be. You cannot appeal to us at election time and forsake us the rest of the time. Not as long as I'm in this seat, not as long as I have this desk with this voice and this fierce urgency to what is, do, what is right to do for Latinas and Latinos in this country as full citizens of the United States. With that, Madam President, I yield the floor.